Good morning, and welcome to our second National Guard Diversity Virtual Update. My name is Colonel Andre Berry, Special Assistant to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. And this morning we'll be having a panel discussion on several important topics that impact our National Guard in the area of diversity and inclusion. During our panel discussion, we will provide information and updates on the Military Leadership Diversity Commission. The commission was established by Congress on the provisions of the National Defense Authorization Act for 2009. The mission of the commission was to execute a wide-ranging review of issues regarding diversity and inclusion in our mi military services. We also will have today military guard leaders who will provide information and updates on diversity initiatives that impact our National Guard soldiers, airmen, and civilians worldwide. We have learned that these virtual conferences will now become our new normal in terms of getting real-time, up-to-date information to our National Guard members in a form that is convenient and utilizes technologies in ways that can be accessed by our workforce. Also with this form, if you have any questions, there will be information where you can ask questions and will be made, made available to all members worldwide in terms of the questions and the answers. So at this time, I would like to introduce our panel for today. Our distinguished guests are General Craig McKinley, Chief of the National Guard Bureau. General Lester Lyles, former Air Force Vice Chief of Staff, Commander of the Air Force Material Command, and Chief of the Military Leadership Diversity Commission. Excuse me, Chairman. Lieutenant General Harry Wyatt, the Director of the Air National Guard. Lieutenant General William Ingram, Director of the Army National Guard. Mr. Lou Cabrera, Comptroller and Director, Administration and Management. Brigadier General James Gorham, Director, Joint Staff, North Carolina Joint Force Headquarters, and Vice Chair of the Joint Diversity Executive Council, and Chief Master Sergeant Denise Zielinski Hall, Senior Enlisted Leader for the National Guard. I'm going to be asking the panel a series of questions today, and they will also have a chance to respond to the questions each individual member. I'm going to start off with General Lyles. And I'm just going to ask you, sir, just give us a brief historical perspective of the role and purpose of the Military Leadership Diversity Commission and what the commissioners would like to see from the military services in terms of progress in the area of diversity and inclusion. Well, Colonel Barry, as you mentioned, the uh, Military Leadership Diversity Commission uh, originated from the National Defense Authorization Act uh, of 2009. Uh, we were established uh, primarily at the impetus of a couple of different congressmen. Uh, congressman Elijah Cummings uh, from uh, Maryland and, and Congressman, former Congressman Kendrick Meeks uh, from Florida. But they had supported the entire House in uh, establishing the act. Uh, you know, the basic uh, unwritten premise that uh, the two congressmen had was that the basic question is why have there not been any women or minorities to achieve senior ranks in the military, and specifically three-star and four-star. Uh, but when we started uh, meeting with the, uh, the authors of the, uh, of the act to find out exactly what it is they wanted us to cover, some 16 major questions we were asked to address as part of this commission, it soon became very obvious that this was more than just an issue relative to three-star or four-star ranks. It was really endemic of the entire Department of Defense and what its support is or belief is in diversity. So uh, we as a body, uh, the commissioners, some 32 of us who were established, uh, decided we would expand the scope of our commission uh, to look at the senior enlisted ranks, uh, to look at all of the ranks in the military, and the focus specifically on the areas of what really is diversity? What does it mean to the Department of Defense? What's the value of diversity? And what are some things that we could recommend back to the Congress and back to the Secretary of Defense to ensure that diversity becomes part of the culture, part of the nature, part of leadership for the military? Uh, we ended up, after about a year's deliberation, which is what the Congress gave us, we ended up with some 20 different recommendations that sort of fell into the general category of definition. How do you define diversity? Uh, leadership, the importance of commitment from leaders, and particularly the tone from the top. Accountability, holding people accountable for believing in and supporting diversity. Uh, mentoring, uh, supporting young men and women at, at all ranks and all ages, if you will, from the time they come into the military until uh, literally they achieve the most senior ranks possible to help them to be literally the best that they can be. Education and training. And then one special topic we address, which was to some people not part of our charter, we address the subject of women in combat because we saw that as a special case dealing with uh, an impact of not having diversity in our ranks. Uh, we did our, uh, our report. 
uh, provided our findings back to the Congress, back to the Secretary of Defense. And then since then, we've been involved literally working with the department to ensure that our recommendations were taken seriously by all parts, all bodies, and that people are beginning to do things to execute them. All right, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna go next to uh, the Chief, uh, General McKinley. And at this time in history, um, why is diversity and inclusion so important and awareness? I mean, what, what, what do we need to know uh, the relevance about why should we be paying so much attention based off of what General Lyles just said? Why is it so important right now? Thanks, Colonel Barry, and appreciate the great leadership that you're exhibiting uh, as my special assistant for diversity here at the National Guard Bureau and your role uh, back in the Nevada National Guard. Uh, to General Lyles, thank you very much for attending today's virtual conference. We appreciate uh, all the things you've done uh, throughout your military career, but even since retirement to put an emphasis and a finer point on the diversity issue. <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, Ondra. Uh, when I testified in front of General Lyles' commission, uh, it became uh, pretty apparent to me and the directors at the time, uh, both who are here today, Bud and Bill, thanks for being here, uh, that we had maybe found a place in time and space that uh, left the National Guard Bureau uh, a little bit unsure of, of where we were, where we stood in, in uh, our roles. The previous chiefs uh, had all contributed to the overall momentum of the National Guard, uh, but quite, quite frankly, when General Lyle's team asked me some very pointed questions that were metrics-based, we couldn't provide the kinds of results that I felt in my heart uh, we needed to have and that I really felt that the adjutants general in the respective states, territories, and the district, two of whom are here, former TAGs, uh, could, could put their arms around. So um, it was apparent that we and I as a new chief of the National Guard Bureau could do better and that this journey never has an end point, but it has uh, starts and stops along the way, but increased leadership from uh, leaders at the top and our senior enlisted leadership when I'm very proud to have Chief Jelinski Hall here who represents really the backbone of the National Guard, uh, the National Guard uh, Enlisted Corps, um, we, we, had to, we had to regroup. And so that effort, General Lyles gave us the opportunity to come together as a team. Uh, Mr. Cabrera working uh, as a former Guardsman and now in his SES capacity here with the Bureau. Uh, to form some things that we felt would move us further along the lines of the goals of the Commission. Not that the Commission itself was the result, but we as an organization could be very proud of. And so in the last three and a half years, uh, we've done some great things, which I'm sure we will elaborate on on this virtual conference, uh, to Ms. Phyllis Brantley and her team who work with you, Ondra, to make sure that we don't lose sight of the goals, the objectives, or how we're doing. And on the heels of a very successful diversity conference in Reno, Nevada, which I thought brought everything together uh, with senior leadership involvement, which we had not had uh, in quantities up to that time, uh, and working with the Joint Diversity Executive Council, which James Gorham is part of as a North Carolinian, uh, working with Bill Burks, the Adjutant General, that, that kind of set the stage. So that's in a general nutshell why it's important, where do we go from here is even more important. Mm -hmm. The past is prologue. We've got emphasis now that we need to take forward uh, through the directorates and through the field and with the adjutant general support uh, and the tools that you and your team have provided us to go to the next level. So that's why I'm excited. All right. Thank you, sir. And because uh, as you talk about that, I, I also think it's important that we kind of dig deeper into the respective services because uh, even though at the National Guard Bureau level we may have a strategy, but it really starts with the Air and Army respective. And so I'm going to direct my next question to General Wyatt. And uh, sir, when, I, when you talk about the Air National Guard, I'm just going to ask you to speak to operationalizing diversity within the organization. What does that mean to you and how does that, uh, can we be more effective and efficient at doing that? Well, I think, you know, it, it starts with a, a recognition that the, uh, the most successful uh, organizations, whether it's inside the military or outside the military, uh, are ones that include diversity in the, in the way they operate, the way they run their, their businesses, uh, their organizations. Uh, General Lyles referenced the need to have a strategy and top-down focus and his commission. And General McKinley, uh, as the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, have certainly given the Air National Guard 
uh, that focus that we need from, from above that uh, calls the attention of our members to the importance of diversity. Uh, General Norton Schwartz, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, uh, I think said it very well when he said that, that mission accomplishment uh, uh, depends upon diversity. Diversity is essential to mission accomplishment. And so what we've tried to do in the Air National Guard is, is take that strategic guidance, that uh, recognition of the importance of diversity to mission success in the Air National Guard and, uh, and operationalize it. And when I say that, I, I'm going to kind of put on my operator's hat and I think about the folks that are out in our, in our wings in the 50 states, uh, territories, Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia. And, uh, you know, most of those folks are, are interested on having some sort of effect, whether it be a kinetic effect or non-kinetic effect uh, on mission accomplishment. And if, if we consider uh, diversity in the world of operationalizing that, what, uh, what the goal is is to, to give our, our wing commanders, our senior enlisted leaders, uh, those tools, those weapon systems, if you will, that will operationalize diversity and make it truly a part of uh, the way we think, how we think, uh, using diversity, uh, if you will, as a, as a uh, force multiplier. Think about the KC-135. It doesn't have any kinetic effects, uh, and yet it is, it is a weapon system that is so important to the United States Air Force because it multiplies the effectiveness of all of our platforms. And if we consider uh, diversity uh, in that light, uh, operationalize the concepts uh, of diversity, uh, recognizing that it can be a force multiplier to mission accomplishment, recognizing that it brings the diversity of thought uh, that we need to come up with solutions to challenges that, uh, that are facing the Air National Guard. Recognize that uh, the beauty of the Air National Guard is that the, probably the, the way that we will reach the operationalizing of diversity is to pull upon the great talent that is resident out in our states uh, bring those thoughts uh, into a plan that will give our wing commanders, our senior enlisted leaders, uh, no kid in a toolbox that will get us to the point that we need to be so that uh, one of these days uh, we won't uh, find the necessity to even talk about diversity because we will live, be living diversity every day. Well, thank you, sir. Well, that, that, that is the goal where it becomes so much a part <coughs> of our organization, our structure, how we do business. It's just who we are versus something that's a set aside or standalone. So thank you, sir. So now we're going to talk about the Army, sir, the Army Guard. And um, we now understand, based off of the MLDC recommendations, that diversity is a core competency or should be in the military. Um, what examples of diversity competencies that are identified in the MLDC report that are considered critical skills and are needed for the future of the National Guard? Well, you know, I think diversity encompasses a lot more than demographics. and. Uh, the United States is probably the most diverse country in, in the world. We have been, we've been the melting pot for a long, long time. And I think the National Guard uh, reflects that, uh, that diverse nature. Uh, we have to, as, as Bud just said and as everybody said, uh, we've got to pay more attention uh, and make sure that we get people with the right range of knowledge, skills, and backgrounds uh, to prevail in this uh, very complex operational environment that we find ourselves in. I think the, uh, the enemy techniques blur the line between combat and non-combat situations is what I was trying to say. And, and attacking our infrastructure, our power grids, uh, as well as our financial institutions, uh, we're going to need people that can operate in, in multiple environments. We're going to need people that, uh, that bring diverse cultural skills because the people that we're dealing and language skills to uh, to the table uh, again the, the range of knowledge skills and uh, and backgrounds blending uh, in our military as well as outside of our military is going to make all the difference in the world as we move forward so uh, the National Guard the Army National Guard is is recruiting people with diverse backgrounds and diverse uh, skill sets to be able to operate in the environment we, that's coming up uh, that we know we're going to meet in the future. So as, again, everyone said, a diverse workforce is, uh, is advantageous to us and it, uh, it encompasses all the, uh, all the competencies that, uh, that's been discussed. Owner, I want to take just an opportunity to thank General Ingram and the Army National Guard and for all that they did 
to kind of keep the, the team together during the environment in which we found ourselves in the middle of the, of the last decade, a, a nation at war, our Army National Guard at war, our Air National Guard deployed at the greatest rate since World War II. Um, your team who focuses on diversity and equal opportunity issues at the Army Guard Readiness Center has done a magnificent job in creating the environment where we could plug back in after the commission and, and then just start launching again. Um, the, in any organization, I think we found, there's an emphasis period and then there's folks who just don't give up. And your folks never gave up during that very complex decade uh, where we took our eye off some of the programs that require senior leadership involvement and emphasis. So congratulations to your team. Well, sir, in the, uh, in the Army stand-up brief this morning, the Chief Staff of the Army uh, was not there today and uh, the Vice took the brief. Uh, General Lloyd Austin, and he made a comment in today's brief and looking around the table uh, that this is the most diverse group that uh, has ever sat at the table uh, with with the people that were there. It, it was a very, um, and, and again, you can look around the table, a very diverse group of people. Yeah, you know, I recall when General Laws was uh, the former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, um, yeah, it felt good. I mean, it was great, but, but what I'm trying to sense is we can't just arbitrarily have onesies and twosies who come along over cycles. Maybe the commission was looking at an institutional, scientific way by which we grow future leaders so that you don't have the episodic Chief Jelinski Hall, who's a female, coming along once every 20 years. Uh, that's the goal here is to have the best that we can put on the table, but General Austin represents the best that I can sense in the United States Army and, and fulfills a great role as you did, sir. Yeah, and, and General McKinley, I think you just hit on a key point that the commission <coughs> noted. And I, I, I told a sort of anecdotal story when we were going through our, our commission. Uh, when I was uh, promoted to my fourth star as the, uh, the vice chief, we had another African-American vice, uh, four star, excuse me, uh, in the Air Force at the time, uh, General Lloyd uh, Fig Newton, who was the commander of Air Education and Training Command. Uh, and we would sit in our Corona conferences with all the other four stars, the chief and the secretary, feeling very, very good about ourselves, very much like uh, General Austin today. But at the same time, we forgot about institutionalizing and really codifying what diversity really meant for the United States Air Force. And the sort of mindset was, okay, we're pretty good in the Air Force. We have two African-American four stars. We don't need to worry about this. And we found out later that we actually were lagging behind the other services because we took our eye off the ball. So uh, part of our recommendation dealt with the institutionalization, things like your Joint Diversity Executive Council that General Gorman leads, uh, things uh, that the Chief is leading uh, and Lou Cabrera are leading to make sure that like in the Air National Guard, right. that you're institutionalizing, excuse me, the National Guard, yes, you're institutionalizing the process and not making it episodic at all. Exactly. Sir, to piggyback off your comments, uh, one of the things that we are doing in the JDAC, uh, we are in the process right now of developing a diversity strategic plan. And part of that tr uh, uh, strategic plan is to pr provide a 20 to 30 year senior leadership pipeline. And so we can have some consistency. And as you say, that's one of the problems that most of the states are involved in right now. When you go out and you look at our formations, you might see onesies, twosies as far as African Americans or females in our formation, but when you look back in at the leaders that's coming up behind them, there's normally a void because we have not looked at this systemically, nor have we looked at it long term. And so we need to develop a mechanism so that we can continue to grow consistently future leaders. I agree, and, and if I can add one last anecdote because it's very, very timely with the uh, sort of consistency. Uh, during the time the commission was meeting or wrapping up, uh, I was invited by the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief to come to the Air Force's first ever diversity conference. Uh, they had uh, all the, the MAGCOMs, all the major commands represented either by the MAGCOM commander or their vice commanders, the three stars. Uh, and I was asked to talk about the MLDC. And unfortunately, because we weren't finished, I couldn't give the final results, but I could talk about the process. But before we did that, I had to do something that was a little bit embarrassing, maybe funny at the time, but sort of sad, and it goes to your point. The first thing I had to say to the chief and secretary uh, is that, you know, you advertise this as the first ever diversity conference for the United States Air Force. Ten years ago, when I was the vice chief, 
we had the first ever diversity <laughs> conference for the Air Force. <laughs> 10 years from now, we will probably have the first ever diversity <laughs> conference for the Air Force unless we institutionalize this and make it part of our culture, part of our core competency, part of what we do every day, and not just something that you'll lose the next time the next leader comes along. So uh, your point about looking at it over a 30 year uh, or whatever time period is right on target. Oh, thank you, really appreciate that. I, I, I recall one of the recommendations from uh, the MLDC was to put, uh, to make a certain level of rank uh, higher ranks in the uh, in the military that uh, you would have to have done something significant with diversity in your career. And the importance of that is is somewhere in your career you had to understand why diversity is relevant to the mission, why diversity is re relevant to the strategy, why diversity is relevant to the future. So it was not some set along program, set aside program, but it was how you had to do business. And I believe that's why you keep talking about you have to institutionalize this initiative so it doesn't go away. So I am hopeful that as a recommendation that our leaders are paying attention to this has to be a core competency that you must learn as you're coming up in your career. So thank you for that. Well, part of yes, everybody's job is to grow leaders. We always yes. have to grow two or three people that can, uh, can follow you or me in any position that we're, that we're in. And we do that by, by picking talent and by mentoring people that are that are the right people to, to move forward. And we have to be very inclusive of everyone uh, when we do that. We have to look across the, across the board and spot those people uh, early uh, that have the potential to, to reach the highest levels and then grow those people and, uh, and give them appropriate assignments and diverse assignments uh, and build the, the bench that everybody's talking about. And we should do that regardless of, uh, of uh, race or sex or anything else. We, have, we just have to do that. And if, if we're doing that across the board and we're mentoring our subordinates to understand that as well, then it permeates the, uh, the organization. And, and I think that's the way we have to do business. As they say, that's just good <coughs> leadership. It is, absolutely. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, I want to go to Mr. Cabrera now with a question. And, and this is something that's talked about across the country that uh, as leaders we have to pay <coughs> attention to. With shrinking resources in 2012, uh, I asked you to describe the National Guard Bureau's diversity progress and how would you recommend we stay on track for future years to come? How do we keep the momentum going and keep it consistent? Well, Colonel Barry. What I've heard right now already stated by the leaders at this table is the answer. You need focus. General Lyle said tone at the top. You need commitment. You need a recognition that the best and brightest flourish in times like this. And so how do you attain? How do you recruit? How do you maintain the best and brightest? I think what this leadership table has already said is that you do that through diversity, through attaining and maintaining the best folks that you can get wherever they may be and put them in the position so that they can flourish and they can achieve what they need to achieve to enable the institution or the enterprise to move ahead. Along with that though comes some decisions. And in, in our case, I think it's been very obvious that there's a need for prioritization. There's a need to determine what is core competencies, what are core values. And I think that the practices and the exercises we have gone through, especially with the JDIC uh, being formed, we've been able to ascertain what is necessary and what is meaningful to the Guard and how are we going to move forward. I think that the JDIC and the way it's organized, composed of adjutants generals, composed of every rank, composed of general officers through senior enlisted civilian representation, and represented in all states has been a remarkable achievement in the last, just the last few years. General McKinley mentioned that he noticed a few years ago when he testified in front of the MLDC that we may have lost some track. Frankly, now I think we're right on track and that's just what's going to take us in the future. What's gonna take us in the future is commitment, leadership, and the structure that we have created that's efficient and effective and the thought processes that we use today or, or structure today will take us through the future. A perfect example, I just want to point out one last example, is this diversity conference, this virtual diversity conference we're hosting today. 
We just had a conference in Reno that was extremely successful, seven, eight hundred folks. Very, very uh, uh, personal uh, structure, face-to-face -face communication. But in this conference, or in this virtual diversity conference, we're going to hit a thousands and thousands of people across the country, and we're frankly doing it at pennies on the dollar. Effective thought processes, leadership commitment, that's where we're going to get, and that's, I think we're on the way to do that. And in my opening comments, I call this, I believe, the new normal. And, uh, and the way our kids learn today, you know, with uh, Facebook and Twitter and you know, all the different mechanisms they use today, I think technology has to be a way forward. And as a, as a fiscal person, I believe from an efficiency standpoint, not just reaching an audience, but, you know, s spending dollars or saving dollars, that we have to look at other forms to do this. And, 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 and do we believe it can be as effective doing it this way? I believe we can. I believe uh, we can reach out and touch people in a different form and, and give them access when it's convenient for them to be able to look at this and learn about what the strategies, initiatives, and updates are when it comes to diversity. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Care and commitment, I believe, is free. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not the So I appreciate that. So. Uh, I'm just going to uh, switch over to uh, General Gorm. And uh, what makes diversity and inclusion efforts tangibly successful? And I'm also going to uh, ask you to, as you as you talk about that, we have learned that a key for, uh, you know, we can talk about this uh, in a forum like this, but at the ground level or the state, territory, District of Columbia level, how how do we ensure that it is important and viable and executed upon? So. Uh, Good question, uh, Colonel Barry. Uh, what I would say would be uh, the fact that what makes uh, diversity and inclusion successful is the same thing that makes every other program or initiative we have in this organization successful, and that is leadership. Uh, diversity and inclusion is a leadership issue at every level of our organization from the top to the bottom. Uh, if uh, every leader, especially our senior leaders, they must be active, they must be vocal, they must be visible in implementing diversity and inclusion uh, strategies. If, they, if we can't get the commitment from senior leaders across the board, a lot of the efforts that, w that are uh, used to address diversity and inclusion will not gain any traction. And traction is very, very important. It's like pushing on the flywheel because traction provides the condition for sustainment. And any program or initiative that is sustained for a long period of time will eventually evolve into culture. And that's what we're at here at uh, the National Guard Bureau and through our organization is to make diversity and inclusion uh, a cultural thing. It's just a part of what we do. That's what, so we don't have to even think about it. It just comes natural. That's the goal. And some of the things that we're trying to do at the JDAC uh, to help the state, to assist the state in their di uh, diversity programs, we are uh, coming up with best practices that we found within our organization, outside of our organization, and we use the State Diversity Council to share that information with the state. We get it at the JDAC, we pass it down to the state. Another thing that we do is we develop tools to help the state's uh, leadership in developing diversity programs. One of those tools is our uh, leadership guide to diversity. And it's all about what the title of this document said. It is a leadership guide to diversity. Uh, every, regardless of what level of leadership you're at, there are roles and responsibilities found in this book that will help you in your growth and development as uh, far as diversity is concerned. These types of things will help our organization as a whole to bring about an environment of trust and respect to every airman, every soldier, every civilian, so that they can be all that they can be. And while they accomplish the mission, they can grow and develop and fulfill their best potential. So these are the, some of the things that we're doing at the JDAC. And I think as we continue to work together and go forth and keep our eye on the ball, stay focused. Because in the field, 
The things that the leaders focuses on and communicates to the team are those things that they deem important and those are the things that they measure. So it's incumbent that we keep diversity at the forefront as we go through this process for years to come because it also says on this document the decade of diversity, implying that we're into this for the long haul. Thank you. And, and General McKinley, I know it was important for you to start the Jade Act after uh, an MLDC meeting, and, uh, and it was important also for you to have a certain kind of makeup. And I don't think maybe sometimes people know who sits on the JDAC and why that is important. So can I actually just talk about that for you know the, the, the type of makeup in terms of leadership and why that was important for you, sir? Well, and I think most of the folks on the panel will agree with this. I won't speak for you, but I know General Lyles, I, you, you kind of taught me this, that when you impose something from headquarters or top down, uh, people at the bottom will do what you ask them to do, but it doesn't necessarily bring the right chemistry or focus that the directors uh, and I feel are imp is important. So um, the National Guard is a very diverse, decentralized organization. And the adjutants general and their staff in the states at the state joint force headquarters really are the execution phase of all the programs and principles that we pass down through the Army and the Air Force and, and through our systems. So I felt that we needed to get buy-in from the people who are actually out in the field making things happen, where they raise up these young people uh, and create the environment that James is talking about. And that Chief Jelinski Hall speaks about wherever she travels. So when uh, General Burks and, and James put their hands up, we looked for volunteers. We want people who really felt the passion to do this. That, that kind of started it. And then we worked with the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute, DIOMI, uh, and at Patrick, we've had several meetings with that leadership, and that's their business. Uh, over time, they've created the environment where all the Department of Defense can, can see the tools, techniques, and procedures that make us who we are. Uh, I felt that at those meetings, those early formative meetings, people came up from the field, the grassroots, supported by the Adjutant General, and we could kind of back off and do the policy thing and not get into people's business. And, and I don't know if you feel that way about that. No, I think that's right on target. That's exactly the right way to look at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, <coughs> and so it, I just thought it important for the field to know that the representation is from the field and we get to hear the voices and we're able to, to mix those with the strategy and give the information and resources and recommendations that are realistic. And it's just not something that we just come up with. So I just thought that was important that uh, that, that was out there. But at the end of the day, uh, the, the backbone or the, from a numerical standpoint or, or such a key is our enlisted force structure. And um, when I think about the business case for diversity and why when we start looking at a return on investment, then I have to go to our senior enlisted leader there and talk about you know, how does diversity impact the, the, the health of our force? Thank you, Colonel Barry. Diversity and inclusion maximizes the potential of our soldiers, airmen, and our civilians. Inclusion is a major factor when we examine issues like sexual assault, suicides, hazing, and other challenging situations. Inclusion strategies such as mentoring, career counseling, and adjustments to policy are key to the, to the health of the force. And I would also add that every National Guard member must be engaged. They need to feel respected, included, and valued. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and, and based off of that, I'm going to kind of switch gears and go back over to Mr. Cabrera just for a second. And uh, does, does the Guard have any initiatives or strategies that are involved in early engagement? Because we keep talking about building a bench and uh, building a future workforce. Is there anything we're doing to, to, to look at the early intervention of getting members interested? Y yes, I have. But first off, I, I want to thank you for mentioning business case and a return on investment because, frankly, we, we have to keep an eye on how we're doing business. We're stewards of federal resources. We have a responsibility to, sure, to ensure that we get what we intend to get. Along with that, though, to your question, we have two programs that are long-term, have been long-term, uh, and they're throughout the United States and throughout communities. The first program that we have is called Starbase. It's an Air Guard-specific program, 
and it's geared at uh, the sixth grade students, fifth and sixth grade students. It's in a, about 15 to 16 states right now where states make commitments, they provide facilities and they provide mostly on air guard locations and it's directed at these at-risk youth and it's a science and math specific uh, endorsement program where they bring these young children in for three or four days of residence along with instructors and they expose them to science and math capabilities that would enhance not only careers throughout the world but enhance their careers potential for military although it's not a military recruitment program but we do that, it's free of cost for the individuals, and it's one of our, uh, I like to think, everybody wonders a lot, why is the Guard so involved in our community? Well, uh, and, and they, there's a question sometimes about core competencies. In, in, in my way of thinking, it's a core value that we have, our relationship with communities. So we reinvest in our community through Starbase. Another uh, program, not similar at all, but with, with some remarkable results is our challenge program. That is focused at the 16 to 21 year old uh, who is not a high school graduate, who is an at-risk student, who in many, many cases are, has already had uh, run-ins, I'll call it run-ins, with the law. All, however, no felony uh, convictions are allowed to participate. And that's where we take kids or young, young adults who have not necessarily succeeded in school and we have them participate in a 21-week residential course. It, it may have many military core values associated with it, but it is not a military program. It is not designed to recruit individuals. In fact, we have very, it's a small percentage, only 10% or so of the graduates enter the military. And lesser than that, less than that, actually join the Guard. So it's not a Guard program, but it is a building program for young adults to learn how to take care of themselves. They develop remarkable principles. They develop some self-confidence. They develop ways to build upon themselves and they, it, we have a re remarkable success. Just last year, we had the 100,000th hundredth, hundredth graduate. Hard to say. Hard to say, <laughs> hard to say. Uh, makes you want to lisp. <laughs> but it, it, we had the 100,000th graduate in that program, it's ongoing for 19 years. It's a remarkable program. We're in 28 states. We have 34 program sites. Uh, it's a remarkable return on investment. In fact, we've had a RAND study that indicates that the return on investment is one of the highest in, in, in terms of government-sponsored programs like that. I might also mention from a, here's another hard word, recidivism rate, nice. it's less than 1% that the students who enter challenge will return to their former lifestyles. And, and I, the wow. former tags can jump in on this, and I know we're running out of time, but I, I want the uh, former tags to talk about another great program. We talk about diversity. We talk about the United States of America. That's very, very important. But the National Guard now has this wonderful program which will celebrate its 20th anniversary called State Partnership. Mm -hmm. Both of these gentlemen, uh, as former TAGs, had a country partner with their state. And that's part of diversity, too. This world is globalized now to an extent that we have got to try to solve problems before they become kinetic operations. So maybe Bud and, and Bill could just take a second on State Partnership. Chief, I think that's a, gr a great example of, uh, you know, if, if you are willing to listen, uh, embrace, and think about uh, the different ways that countries handle similar challenges to some of the challenges we face, state partnership program is a, is a great example. Uh, it's the adjutant general of Oklahoma. Our, our state partner was uh, the country of Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan is a Muslim country, and yet it's uh, a former uh, Russian satellite uh, very pro-Western in the way that they think, kind of a, an oddity in that, in that part of the world. And uh, what we learned in, in working with the Azeris, uh, uh, primarily initially in the enlisted uh, endeavors as we stood up a, uh, uh, an NCO academy uh, for their military, uh, is the different ways that they approach some of the, the threats to their country, uh, the nar narcotics, the, the terrorism threats, the uh, the transnationals that uh, uh, transited through uh, their space. Uh, they had similar challenges with the oil industry, uh, the pipeline system that is in Azerbaijan that we do in Oklahoma. And just, just by opening the doors and listening to the way that that uh, diverse community handled the challenges opened our eyes. And I'm sure that the exchanges uh, 
that we brought to them uh, help them meet the challenges. So it's, I think it's a very practical example of how diversity can work uh, to, to help an organization, or in this case a country, meet the challenges of the day. And Bill, I, w I attended your, your celebration of your newest partner, and you might want to talk about uh, Botswana. Well, I'll be happy to. We, we were uh, engaged in the mid-90s with uh, the Republic of Moldova in uh, Eastern Europe, and that posed similar challenges uh, uh, that Bud just discussed. But uh, we took on a new partner after AFRICOM was formed uh, in the, the country of Botswana. And the Botswana Defense Force is a, is a very, uh, it, totally different. I mean, compare Moldova and Botswana is apples and grapes. And it's, uh, I, I won't say both ends of the spectrum, but just very different. Uh, but similar challenges in some cases. Uh, and I think it was really good for our soldiers uh, to interact both in Africa and in Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, it broadens everyone's horizons. They understand global challenges. They understand uh, cultures and people from different places. And uh, it, it's a very rewarding experience to work with uh, internationals anyway. And I think that adds to the to the flavor of the Army National Guard, or the National Guard in general, um, having the opportunity to uh, exchange with those countries, have uh, soldiers from, from both of those countries come to the, to the United States and train with us and send teams to, to those countries, uh, greatly enhances our, our diversity while we're doing that. So uh, those are great programs. And I think they're tremendously beneficial to the, to the State Department. They, the ambassadors in both countries and as well as the State Department absolutely love them and it, it's, a, it's a great way to, uh, to interact uh, as, a, as a United States, not just the United States military. Let, let me uh, mention one reason why these uh, sort of community outreach or state partnerships or international partnerships are, are so important, particularly for uh, those of us here in the United States. Uh, one of the startling statistics we had in the MLDC report is it's no surprise for people who've looked at this. It's uh, the fact that 70 percent, 70 percent of our young people today in the United States are not eligible for the military. And if you look just at the minority population, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, that number goes up to something like 85 percent. So when you talk about building a pool, if you will, of potential candidates of future leaders for our military, we're automatically handicapped unless we're doing something at a very early age to counter those kinds of situations, those kind of environments, and change that statistics. So we have an eligibility pool, if you will, of people who can be the future leaders at uh, enlisted, senior enlisted, uh, officer or civilian ranks for the United States military. So uh, these kind of outreach programs are just outstanding. I really applaud you for, for the, what the Guard is doing. Thanks for that I'd, comment. I'd like to add to that, sir, is that I, I think the, the National Guard, with over 2,800 locations throughout the country, is uniquely postured to do that and do it very well. Yes. Wow. And, and you know, we talk about 2,800 locations, but we're in every zip code. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just the locations, because we draw from uh, the surrounding communities, and, and we are probably the most diverse and the most uh, um, inclusive organization in the in the nation. Fantastic. Well, thank you. You know, I, and sometimes I hope that's a paradigm shift for sometimes when people want to lock diversity just into a, a certain category or a label. And uh, this also teaches us that we need to have the core competencies, the skills, the languages to be able to deploy our people to have a mission anywhere in the world. And so that's such a big part of diversity when we talk about it. You know, I, I got one last question I want to just ask the panel if that's okay. And, um, and I just asked, you know, the, the key word I keep hearing is how do you institutionalize this? How do you keep it going? How do we keep the momentum going? And I'm just going to ask you to, to tell our audience what, what, what can we do? What, what's, what's one or two things you could recommend briefly? To, if I'm a leader in an organization, I have high ops tempo and I have, you know, challenging budgets, I have all these things going on, what could you recommend that I could do to institutionalize diversity? We've talked about the Leader's Guide. We've talked about the JDAC. You know, we've talked about some programs that are out there, but I just asked each of you to kind of think of just something briefly you could tell our leadership 
that if I want to keep this going, it's not about a certain person being in the position or it's not about, you know, under this regime, so to speak, but how do I keep this going so it, it, it keeps going beyond <coughs> my tenure here? What can we throw out there? So I Let's just start with know. Chief Jelinski okay. Hall, because we, we always start up here. Yep. Let's start yeah, down there. Yeah, okay. writing frantically. <laughs> 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 I appreciate that question, Colonel Barry, and it's a very, very good question. There are so many things that we can do, and I appreciate so much that we have this Joint Diversity Executive Council at the National Guard Bureau level. And with our state, you know, each state now has been charged, if you will, with establishing a State Diversity Initiative Council. And it's those councils that are going to lead diversity initiatives and uh, various, you know, the program, if you will, okay? But ensure that each state is very strong across the 54, the states, territories, and the district. So keeping that alive, ensuring that we've got the right people on that council so that way it is spread throughout the 54, we carry that to our state partnership programs as well. And, you know, I think it's some, some things as simple as just, you know, that respect for all, treating everyone with dignity and respect you know, our generation has grown up quite differently than the, the younger generation. Good, bad, and different, okay. But they, they look at diversity so much differently than we do. To them, people are people. You know, I talked to my daughter about diversity, and she just, she kind of scratches her head because to her, people are people. And you treat everyone fair and with dignity and respect. I think if we practice those things, that, that we will keep it at the forefront in our organization. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one of the things that we can do that is cost effective, doesn't cost a penny, just cost your time, would be mentoring at every level, uh, especially to mentor those who do not look like you, those who come from a different background to you, and those who have a different culture than you. To, co to, to, to mentor them and, uh, and to, uh, in that mentoring process, make sure we educate and train our young leaders coming up the importance of diversity throughout our organization because what we have to do to sustain this is we have to ensure that our leaders that are coming up have the same mindset as we are as, as, as in regard to diversity and inclusion so we can have some sustainability. Thank you. You know, I said somewhat flippantly a, a few minutes ago that care and commitment are free. Um, they aren't free. I mean, they do cost time, um, but there's not a price tag on them. And I, and I think the way uh, this can endure is th through commitment. Uh, General McKinley's already mentioned his commitment to this and certainly he, he has executed and displayed that very consistently for the last several years. Um, I, I, I think what I saw at the last diversity conference in Reno and, uh, and through some of your presentations, uh, Andra, and through some other presentations that I saw, if there's anything I felt at that particular conference was commitment. And I, I think we need to ride, we need to nurture that, we need to reward it, and uh, w I think that's what's gonna take us through. Thank you. I think leaders uh, set the tone for, for organizations and it's a top-down thing, but intermediate leaders at every level, uh, all of us need to create a, um, an environment where everybody can rise to their highest potential. And I think that's a, that's a hallmark of leadership anyway, but uh, creating that culture, creating that environment that just allows people to flourish and uh, they may not flourish where they think they want to, uh, but matching up the right person uh, with the right job at every level, allowing them to, uh, to grow, uh, to get broader in their perspective of uh, of the organization and the types of jobs that they'll have uh, through a career and a lifetime. Uh, that's what we can do as leaders to allow our, our people to reach their highest potential. Thank you. You know, I've, I've given a lot of thought to, uh, to that question, uh, Andra, uh, personally, because uh, I think it's already been mentioned that, you know, from our respective levels, you know, we, we have the ability to participate in forums like this, to develop strategies, Air National Guard's case to uh, uh, ask our strategic planning system to help uh, the Air National Guard operationalize uh, the, the diversity inside the Air National Guard. But I'm going to take this maybe down to an even a, a more operational, a tactical, a personal level. The thought occurred to me the other day that uh, 
and all the jobs that I've interviewed in my entire life, no one has ever asked me a question on diversity. Mm -hmm. um, I get the opportunity to select a few people uh, as leaders, and, and this kind of goes to General Gorman's uh, uh, comment about where do we find the type of leaders that we need to take the Air National Guard into the future? Where do we find those leaders who recognize the importance of diversity and have an idea uh, how uh, we should implement uh, the diversity initiatives to get us to where we want to be? Why can't, as I interview, I mean, irrespective of whether I'm, I'm talking to a, a man or a woman or an African-American or a Caucasian or a, a, an Asian-American, uh, regardless of whether it's officer enlisted, why can't I ask every individual that comes before me for a leadership position, you know, give me your definition of diversity. Uh, is it important to you? Is it important to our organization? Uh, if you think it is, how would you implement uh, diversity at the operational level to lead your flight, your squadron, your wing, your organization. And if you, if you find individuals who, who are uncomfortable with that question and cannot articulate an answer, maybe that's not the type of individual that you want to lead the Air National Guard into the future. Uh, I get to write uh, memorandums of instruction, letters of instruction to boards. And I'm not going to tell them specific questions to answer, but if I tell that board that you know, the successful applicant uh, will have a view of diversity that will be advantageous to the Air National Guard. I'll bet they'll ask some questions about an individual's belief on diversity. So that's what I intend to do uh, personally. Uh, so all you folks out there in TV land are going to interview for a job. Now you know one topic you need to study up on. But uh, that's what I intend to do individually. Thank you, sir. It's a perfect opportunity to, to address this, that one of the initiatives that the JEDEC has this year for FY13 is to develop questions for boards, for all ranks, mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, to promote, you know, fairness, equity, mm -hmm. and to ensure that we're leading from the front with doing just what you said, sir, and that's going to ensure that we have the people that possess the right skills to really lead diverse groups. So, good for you, sir. And just Great. so you know, sir, we're working on those questions. Yes. <laughs> we had a we had yep. our first talk about it last week, so you were just so right Spot on. Spot on. Okay. Yep. Could, Spot could on. I, can I just interject just a little bit here in, in regards to because it just popped in my mind right then and I thought it was a great idea, so I'm going to suggest it for our audience and whatnot. What about uh, thinking out of the box? Uh, we know in our organization there are certain positions that we aspire to attain in order to continue to move up the ranks. Of, of progression in our organization. Uh, what would be really neat is to make one of those positions a diversity type position where you have to hold a diversity officer's position in a, in a battalion or a company as part of the upward mobility to make sure that people are competing to try to get into diversity to make it alive and keep it going like we do like say in a or infantry battalion where you know there's a certain position, the S3 or the XO that people vie for. Say a young company commander comes along and does a good job, you know, and you're gonna groom him for battalion command, but before he gets there, we might need to put him in a diversity position where he's gonna be involved with diversity and, and then promote him into that position so people can start to see that, hey, it's good to get into diversity because it helps you as far as your upward mobility in the organization. Just a thought there occurred in my mind right then. Okay. Out of the box thinking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine I've had a chance to think about uh, th that, that question uh, throughout the entire life of the MLDC. Uh, and I applaud every one of the points mentioned by each one of the other panel members. Uh, and I know uh, General McKinley also agrees with it, with each one of their points. I guess if I, ha if I have to sort of come down to one comment, it would be uh, sort of centered around the word communication. Um, Throughout my uh, career in the Air Force, I always told people I had a three-word motto for good leadership, and it was communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, I could change that and modify it a little bit and say it could be uh, uh, care and commitment and, and culture uh, based on some of the comments mentioned around the table. But uh, to me, we don't communicate with people well enough about what's of value uh, to our institutions, what's of value to our commanders, what's of value to our nation. And we, we have an opportunity with our education and training program from 
the most basic airman uh, or enlisted person coming into our service uh, uh, to the, the junior officers, to the civilians coming in to make sure they really understand how we value and need diversity in our United States military at all different levels. And once you do that at the very, very beginning uh, and inculcate that throughout their careers, to me, that changes the culture. It would really change the culture. So I'll use that as uh, sort of my one word to answer to your question, but our whole report to some extent addresses that same thing. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Colonel Barry, and your team for uh, setting this up. This panel discussion has been very helpful for me, uh, and it's always a pleasure to sit with the great leadership team that's here today. And to General Lyles, thanks for all you've done uh, to reinforce uh, the fundamental uh, value that uh, the Commission brought to all of the service chiefs. I know as I sit with them how much they appreciate your leadership. Um, quite frankly, 375 years of history makes the National Guard uh, one of the oldest institutions in this nation before we were a nation. And the common values that say that we must have a country, a nation where the safety, security, dignity, and ability to achieve is, is there for every citizen has been a fundamental value for our National Guard, as well as our military services. And they do not go unchallenged. And we should not expect to, to live in a time where we don't have to have those core values present. I would say, as General Lyles just said, that this is not a program. This is a, this is a guaranteed right of every individual and for all of us to uphold the values to give every person those uh, inalienable rights to achieve and to be part of a great nation. If we lose that, we lose sight of what our founding fathers set this country up to be. And so it's not a program, it's a passion. Uh, all of us need to support it, uh, uh, nurture it, never continue to say it's achieved, it's always a journey. And as long as we do that, this organization called the National Guard will continue to flourish and, and great people will have great opportunities to contribute to that. So thanks to everybody today for that opportunity. Uh, Andre, if I could add, and yes, I'd be remiss if I didn't do this, and I'm not saying this uh, because of this particular forum, but Lou actually heard me say this at one of our commission hearings. Uh, the National Guard benefits from having a great leader at the top. Uh, General Craig McKinley has just been fantastic in every aspect from operational to certainly this very important topic of, uh, of diversity. And uh, I couldn't imagine a, a stronger, better leader uh, to lead the way for this institution, both in this area or any other for our nation. So, Thanks. Craig, thank you for your great service to our nation and your great service to the National Guard. Thanks, General Wiles. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. Thank you, sir. And I'll just say, first of all, thank everyone on the panel, our special guests, uh, for your contribution, for how you added value, and for the message that you're going to send nationwide to our airmen, soldiers, and civilians in terms of getting a better understanding of education, but also hearing what leadership feels in their gut about diversity. And I'll just tell this to our, our audience is to make sure that you have a chance to download and read the MLDC report. It's so important that that great work that was done, that we do not allow that just to be remiss. And, and how do we really get to have best practices and strategies that work. A lot of that is institutionalized through the how we will execute on that information. And something I've been saying lately I think is so important. If we're really going to go to the next level with diversity is we have the information now. We have what, what organizations have done, strategies, but now we got to have our heart into it. And when you have your heart into it and your passion into it and you mix that with great information and strategies and education, we can continue to be a leader in a topic that is so important. And General McKinley, I'll say this in closing, you tied diversity into safety a few years ago. And when we look at diversity as important as we look at safety, I don't think we'll be having these forums anymore. So I appreciate and applaud everyone. If you have any questions uh, for this commission or uh, this panel, please put them uh, uh, out to us and we will get them back to you. And I just ask you and encourage you to pay attention to the information you get from this virtual diversity update. And we look forward to seeing you again in about three months. Thank you very much.